Hi, my name is Ben Coyman. I'm with the Academic Skills team at ANU, and this workshop looks at academic integrity and referencing. Now, this workshop is designed to help you with your assignment, uh, your first one for this subject. For this assignment, you've been given the following question. Financial accounting provides useful information for investors in trading stocks. However, investors may not always use this information. Why do individual investors not use accounting information when they make stock trading decisions? So to answer this question, you need to write one paragraph of around 150 to 200 words and use evidence from the following three sources. The Blankspor et al. article that you've been provided with, an online source that is not a journal article, and one other source of your choice. So for this assignment, you're required to correctly cite all sources uh, with in-text citations in the Harvard referencing style. You also need to include at least one quotation from one of those sources, and you must include a correctly formatted reference list uh, for all three sources, again using the Harvard style. The assignment is compulsory and worth 5% of your grade for this course and is submitted through the Business 7008 Academic Integrity and Referencing Workshop Wattle site, so the site where you're watching this video. And the assignment is due on Friday the 22nd of March. To get you started on this assignment, we're going to talk a little bit about why we use sources in our work, why we need to reference those sources, and how we can uh, cite and paraphrase and summarize those sources effectively. So the reason we use sources in our assignment is quite simply because it shows evidence of scholarly research. It also helps us to display our understanding of the subject matter and also provides support for our argument or key message. So if we're only talking about our opinions, then we don't really have an argument in our work. Whereas if we are referring to other sources, that demonstrates that we have researched, that we have broadened our understanding of a subject and that we can write from a place of understanding based upon that research. And the types of academic sources we can use in our assignments include things like books or book chapters, uh, journal articles, uh, reports by governments or businesses or organizations, newspaper articles, magazine articles, uh, certain websites particularly ones which end with .org, .edu, or .gov. And it's worth thinking about which are the more academic sources and what makes them academic. And on the Waddle site, you'll find a really useful uh, finding sources resource, which has information on how you can go about evaluating sources. So when you begin to undertake research as part of your assignments, you are actually entering a scholarly community. The way that community works is that uh, researchers will undertake research, they will produce papers based on their research, and those papers will be peer-reviewed and published. And these will then become evidence for your essay, and you will in turn undertake research, write papers, and if you go into higher degree studies or PhD studies or what have you, then you will also be producing papers that are peer reviewed, published and becoming evidence for other scholars. So that is a way that the scholarly community works. And within that community, it is very important to abide by the principles of academic integrity. Uh, when we talk about academic integrity, we're talking about acting with integrity in our research and writing, which means producing our own work, uh, not collaborating with others where it isn't allowed, not recycling old assignments, not plagiarizing, and always acknowledging our sources. So two key components of the academic integrity principle are that a student's work must always be genuine and original and completed only with the assistance that is permitted by the rules and guidelines of the university. And in particular, that means that the academic integrity principle requires the words, ideas, scholarship, and intellectual property of others, so basically other people's work and research, to always be appropriately acknowledged. 
and a person is in breach of this principle if they plagiarize or engage in collusion, which means act working with others when that isn't allowed. And there is a plagiarism spectrum uh, which ranges from examples of poor practice that can be worked on and avoided uh, to serious breaches that are problematic. And at the poor practice end of the spectrum might be issues such as using a source too closely when paraphrasing, so not really putting something into our own words sufficiently, or maybe copying work from a source without a citation, so forgetting to reference. And we understand that accidents do happen, particularly when we are beginning our academic journey, but it is important that we avoid these mistakes, and if we make them, that we learn from them and adapt in future. Uh, in the middle end of this spectrum is reusing work you've done for an earlier assignment, or working with other students to complete an individual task. So when you do these things, you're actually gaining an unfair advantage over other students. So we must always start new assignments from scratch, and we must work, complete work individually unless collaboration is permitted. And then at the deliberate end of the spectrum is things like buying, stealing, or borrowing other people's work, or paying someone to do your work for you. And these are considered very serious breaches, and they are penalized quite severely. So these must be avoided at all costs. And referencing is one way, way that we can uphold the principles of academic integrity. Uh, on the Waddle site, there are some resources to help you develop your referencing skills, including a referencing and academic integrity self-assessment, a referencing lesson with step-by-step -step instructions on how to cite correctly, and the Monash Harvard Referencing Guide, which is a really valuable resource. So we recommend that you look at these resources to help equip you with the skills you need for your first assignment. Now, as I said earlier, we can't simply use other people's words wholesale in our assignment, otherwise that will be detected as plagiarism. So it is important that we incorporate other people's research through quotation or summarizing or paraphrasing. And quoting is using other people's words but putting them inside quotation marks so it's very clear that we're quoting other people. Summarizing is when we explain someone's overall argument in our own words, uh, which is sort of macro level work. And at the micro level is what we would call paraphrasing, where we take a sentence or short passage from another source and paraphrase it, so put it into our own words. Uh, here we have a sample quote, and I'll point out a few key aspects of it. Uh, firstly, there's some introductory text. We can't just dive right into the quotation. We always need to provide some kind of transition or segue. Then you'll notice that the quote itself is presented in quotation marks, uh, single inverted commas, and then we have the reference afterwards, so any quotation must be accompanied by a reference, and in the Harvard style, you notice that includes an author, a date of publication, and a page number. And there are also other aspects of referencing, such as titles, publishers, etc., which would go in the reference list at the end of the assignment. And the referencing lesson on Wattle has step-by-step -step instructions for quoting, sorry, for referencing both in text and in the reference list. Uh, when you do quote, the quote needs to match the original text exactly, otherwise you're paraphrasing it. Uh, it must be formatted correctly, so it needs to be inside those inverted commas. As I said, there must always be a reference and a page number if it comes from a text that has page numbers. And as I said, you need to always segue into the quote in order to provide context, otherwise it can be quite jarring for the reader if you switch from your words to someone else's quite abruptly. However, we would recommend that you don't overquote. Uh, save the quotes for really special sound bites or key points that would be difficult for you to reword. In general, we want to see you paraphrase and summarize because that's how you demonstrate your understanding of the material. 
Here we have a sample summary, and again, I'll point out a few key aspects. One being that you indicate what the author is doing. The author might be arguing, they might be discussing, they might be describing. Uh, it's good to use those sorts of uh, reporting verbs to indicate what the author is doing. And of course, we have a citation, so even though you're putting it into your own words, you still need to reference the source of the idea or information. And again, the referencing lesson on Wattle has instructions for doing this. You might be wondering, should I summarize or should I paraphrase? As I said, a summary is usually macro level work where you're dealing with a big article or a big idea. And paraphrasing is when you're dealing with content at the micro level. So particular information from a sentence or paragraph within that work. Uh, it's important to hold on to some of the terminology that the author uses, otherwise you'll end up writing about something that is completely different. So you always need to use some of the key words and terminology, but you can change the words around that and the order of the information and the general expression of the idea. And paraphrasing can be hard to do sometimes, so it is important to work at developing that skill. Uh, when summarizing or paraphrasing, it is important to work from your notes rather than the original text. If you work from the original text, there's the risk that you will be dependent on the way the author expresses those ideas, so it is much better to take notes and then work from your notes. And this also helps you to change the structure and wording of the original. Uh, in terms of what information you include, that will always depend on the purpose of the task. So just to demonstrate, um, I'd like to go through the paraphrasing process for a short passage of text. Um, I won't read this aloud, so you can just pause the video here and read that paragraph. Okay, now that you've paused the video and read that paragraph, you'll notice that some of the key points of this are that Woolworths is the number one Australian supermarket, so Congratulations, Woolworths. It controls 40% of an $80 billion industry here in Australia, and its biggest competitors are Coles and IGA. Here we have uh, three paraphrases of that, um, and the first two are problematic. So the first one you'll notice is a bit too similar to the source in terms of structure and phrasing, so it works through the ideas in the exact same order. Now the second one, you'll notice from the bold text, is quite similar in phrasing. So that bold text, supermarket industry worth around $80 billion annually, is identical to the source. Um, and you would be probably picked up by Turnitin for that, so it is important to try and paraphrase as thoroughly as possible. Uh, the third one though, is okay um, because it has different structure and different wording. So always keep that in mind when you're paraphrasing that you need to alter the structure and phrasing, uh, the order in which ideas are expressed, and also the actual wording used. Uh, it, your paraphrase should be different to the source while still preserving some of that key terminology. So for instance, a supermarket industry Australia, $80 billion. Uh, if you change these things, then you're actually changing the information. So the key thing is to change the wording and the structure around those key terms. So as I said, it is always important to paraphrase from notes. And you can see here how the original paragraph has been converted into note form, and then the paraphrase has built upon those notes rather than working directly from the source. Uh, some tips for summarizing and paraphrasing. Uh, only use relevant material and ideas. Um, don't paraphrase and summarize stuff that is off topic. So always be guided by your research question. Uh, as I said, don't be too dependent on the source when it comes to paraphrasing and summarizing. Uh, once again, that's why you have the note-taking process. It's a, a way for you to take the key information and begin the process of translating it into your own words. 
And afterwards, it's a good idea to compare what you've written to the original, just to make sure that you've conveyed the same meaning while also using different words, altering the sentence structure, and make sure you always provide a citation. And when it comes to writing the assignment, obviously you need to put it all together into paragraph format. Um, maybe just pause uh, for a moment and have a read of this paragraph. Okay, so now that you've done that, you'll notice how we have a topic sentence at the beginning, which introduces the theme of the paragraph. We have a concluding sentence that ties together all those threads. And in the middle, we have information taken from other sources. Uh, that's been uh, coded in different colors. You don't need to do color coding in your assignment. We've just done it here for your reference. Uh, and you notice that each source has its own reference. Um, each sentence, we point the reader to where the information comes from. And you'll notice that some of those references are at the end of a sentence, which is called info-prominent referencing, and some, or one, is at the start of a sentence, which is called author-prominent, where we introduce the information by introducing the author, because obviously the author is either being quoted or has played a key role in developing that content. So if you're simply referring to a fact, you can put a reference at the end of a sentence, but if you feel the author should be uh, emphasized, or if you have quoted, it's good to put the author up front, and you'll notice that the page number also always accompanies a quotation. On what will you be able to access a Turnitin practice site? Now, as you begin your academic journey and uh, paraphrasing and summarizing for the first time in the higher education context, it is a good idea to run your work through Turnitin to ensure that you have paraphrased sufficiently and to ensure that you haven't accidentally quoted the source. Um, and you can do that by submitting your work to this Turnitin practice site to produce a Turnitin similarity report. And that will highlight any text that is too close to the source. Uh, you'll see here um, matching text has been highlighted. There is an overall percentage of matching text. The sources of those matches have been identified. And you can then use this as the basis for altering your, your assignment before you create a final submission. Uh, just make sure that if you do want to practice uh, using Turnitin, that you go specifically to the practice site and do not submit works to the official Turnitin sites that are attached to each course and assignment. So the next steps from here will be firstly to complete the referencing quiz and lesson uh, on Wattle, to read through the assignment instructions and analyze the question, to read the assigned text as well as find additional sources, and then of course write your response and submit it to Wattle or submit it to Turnitin Practice in the first instance if you want to check your paraphrasing and make alterations. Uh, and of course make sure that you always acknowledge sources in the correct format and follow the Harvard style correctly and there is that guide up on the Wattle site and it's definitely a good idea to bookmark it for future work. Remember, we will be having drop-ins related to this assignment in week four, and we wish you all the best for this assignment, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much, and have a great day.